Now, begin thy magic spell. In February of 1938, Walt Disney brought their first iconic villain to the screen. Reveal her name! Not just a evil queen, the evil queen. Snow White's nemesis would set the standard for nearly a hundred years of fierce, fabulous witches. Well, here's your precious princess. Sneaky scoundrels. Seize him! And odious outcasts. You're so weird. You have no idea. Disney villains were meant to root for their downfall, but somehow these scene stealers are more beloved and memorable than the heroes. Whether we hate to love them or love to hate them makes no difference to these iconic witches, wizards, and weirdos who, for the better part of a century, have been having the time of their lives. Forgive me a cruel chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by idiots. And who's been among their biggest fans from the very beginning? Hashtag the gays. Oh, I shall practice my curtsy. But why? What is it about Disney villains that's so appealing to gay audiences? Hey there, I'm Matt Baum. I make videos about pop culture, and this time we're looking at some of Disney's greatest villains and figuring out what makes them so iconic, so relatable, and so popular in particular with the gays. Tell me more about myself. Also, a quick heads up. Instead of covering every Disney villain ever, I'm going to pick about a dozen of my favorites to talk about. Because as of the start of 2020, there have been 749 Disney films. I've seen a lot of them, but not every single one. So if I miss any of your favorites, let me know in the comments. Also, I'm only going to be talking about the villains from the main theatrical features. No sequels, no prequels, no remakes, no directive videos, no television. Sorry, fans of The Black Cauldron 2, Return of the Cauldron. And if you want to watch any of the movies that we talk about, I have links to them in the description, plus a link to my Patreon where I'll be posting bonus videos with material that just didn't fit into the script. So maybe you're familiar with this phenomenon, or maybe not, but a lot of gay men, particularly those of a certain age, love the bad guys in classic Disney movies. Everybody would rather write for Captain Hook than for Peter Pan. They're just more fun. I don't know why. Even though Disney's never had a canonically gay villain, still, a lot of them seem to have a sort of gay aura. So are they really queer, or are we just seeing something that's not really there? Well, let me show you what's going on, starting with Disney's first feature film, Snow White. Alas, for her. For the first try, Disney nailed it. Her catchphrase is still iconic. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? She's intense. She's focused on her dreams. She's got a shady best friend. Alas, she is more fair than thee. But the queen wasn't always so intriguing. Disney's original plan was to make her more goofy. By, I mean silly, not literally played by goofy, though I wish. But as Disney developed the film through the 30s, they abandoned the comedy queen concept and instead gave her traits that audiences would have associated with coded lesbians. Now, you might already know all about queer coding in Hollywood movies, but if not, let me just give you a quick overview so we can see how audiences of the time would have viewed the evil queen. Then we'll come back to Snow White. From the very start of motion pictures, there were always characters meant to be read as gay. I'm telling you, if we could get the runs with this show that these dames get in their stockings, I'd be able to make the second payment on my kimono. Morning, Eba. <laughs> but, Your Majesty, you cannot die an old maid. I have no intention to, Chancellor. I shall die a bachelor. But all that changed around 1934 with the creation of a censorship program called the Hayes Code. The code banned all sorts of things in films, like interracial couples and showing disrespect to priests and police officers. It also banned homosexuality in movies, or as it was called back then, sex perversion, which I think sounds like a lot more fun. The code also required that any depiction of sin only occur with villains, and that any sinful characters had to be punished by the end of the movie. So during the Hayes Code, movies couldn't show sympathetic characters who were explicitly queer, but they could show characters that conformed to queer stereotypes as long as they were villains. Around the same time that Disney was working on Snow White, movies started applying queer coding to villains as a way to make them seem more unnerving and indecent. There was already a prevailing cultural fear that homosexuals were coming to get you and your kids, and movies could tap into that anxiety by showing villains getting uncomfortably intimate with characters of the same sex. Have you ever modeled before? No, I haven't. You won't object to removing your blouse, will you? So what does any of this have to do with the evil queen, and what about her as lesbian coded? Well, she's older and unmarried. She's in a position of power that's usually held by men. She's cold and unemotional. Well, all right, to be fair, she does have one emotion, pissed, and she is very good at it. She's also tall with a strong jaw and a deep voice and a pretty commanding presence. Silence! You know 
the penalty if you fail. These are all traits that are stereotypically unwomanly. And coding like this was a way of using stereotypes as a shorthand that audiences were likely to recognize. Under the Hayes Code, queer coding was used exclusively to communicate that there's something unwholesome, something off about the villains that made them a threat to the wholesome, innocent heroes. And what is that threat? Well, the Queen's in a jealous rage because Snow White is better at feminine beauty than she is, so she wants to have Snow White killed. And not just killed, she wants to possess Snow White's heart. Probably no symbolism going on there. And when she doesn't get what she wants, she turns to another classic ploy of the queer-coded villain, the seduction. She tempts Snow White with the forbidden fruit. Taste it. Taste it. Taste it. Taste it. Oops, sorry, wrong apple. Queen, have a bite. This worked great for Disney. The Evil Queen is legitimately scary, even today. And if I'm being honest, I like her scenes a lot better than Snow White's, and we'll talk about why in just a bit. Giving the Queen a sinister queer coding worked so well that Disney did it again, and again, and again, and again. Check out 1953's Peter Pan. This time, it's Captain Hook who's given traits that audiences would have considered unmanly and associated with gay men. He's a fancy, vain man who dresses in feathers and ruffles in pink, he's intimate with his male confidant, he's cowardly, and he can only win a fight by tricking his opponent. In the back, Captain? Also, Hook's a grown man obsessed with capturing a boy, something that audiences of the time just accepted as fact that homosexuals do. You see, Ralph was a homosexual a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. Disney would take that vibe even further in 1959 with Maleficent. She wants to get revenge on the royal family after the birth of their daughter, so she bestows a curse that on Aurora's 16th birthday she'll prick her finger on a spindle and die. So what's queer coded about that? All right, well, hear me out. Maleficent's a villain who waits until a girl is on the cusp of womanhood, then puts her into a trance and lures her away and jabs her with a deadly prick that brings the girl to ruin and unable to marry the prince. Touch the spindle. Touch it, I say. Sleeping Beauty was one of Disney's last films made under the Hays Code, which started to fall apart in the 1960s. A handful of big-name directors started just ignoring the rules and making movies that were considered more daring, like Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot, where two men go undercover as women to hide from the mob. Some Like It Hot never got approval from the censors, but the studio just released it anyway. You've never laughed more at sex, or a picture about it. International films didn't even bother with the code, which is how you get 1961's Victim from the UK, a surprisingly progressive film about a group of gay men. That also leans pretty heavily on stereotypes sometimes. What crime linked an aging hairdresser and a famous star of the theater? Yeah, whatever could link those two things, I wonder. Anyway, by the late 60s, more explicit movies like Psycho, which features some creative ideas about masculinity, had bent the rules of the code so far that movie studios realized they could basically ignore it, and the code went away. Well, didn't completely go away, it just got replaced by the rating system that we still use today. By the 60s, queer coding had become such a well-established shorthand for untrustworthy outsiders and evildoers that it just stuck around. Take Disney's Robin Hood in 1973, a film that I watched approximately 8 billion times between the ages of 4 and 12. Robin's nemesis is Prince John, who has all the tropes of a classic Disney fop. He's cowardly, he's vain, he's fussy. But Disney added one more gay stereotype to John, an unseemly attachment to his mother, which at the time was believed to be a cause of homosexuality. Oh, mommy. I've got a dirty thumb. Sorry to hear that. As with the other villains, John's obsessed with the hero of the same sex. It's Robin Hood I want, you idiot! Yeah, you and everyone else on F.A. John even tries to stop Robin and Maid Marian from hooking up, right after ripping Robin's clothes off. Again, probably nothing to unpack there. Seize him. I wonder if images like these had any impact on my developing psyche. Probably no way to know. Oh well. Anyway, Disney kept using queer tropes to make villains scary through the 80s, with Radigan and the Great Mouse Detective. Oh Felicia, my precious. Another fussy fop. This time the villain's hiding a terrible secret about his true nature. He's a closeted rat trying to pass as a mouse. So Radigan's a world great. <laughs> and it continued right up through the Disney renaissance of the late 80s and early 90s. Ursula follows the coding of an older, unmarried woman occupying a position of power with a deep voice. Maybe Disney's deepest voice villain to date. Pathetic. And that's on top of the fact that Ursula's look is based on Divine, a drag queen from Baltimore who's the star of a ton of John Waters films. 
Disney artists struggled to find a look for Ursula until producer and songwriter Howard Ashman, who was also from Baltimore, pushed them to use Divine as inspiration. P.S. Check out my John Waters video for more about that. Then in 1992, we've got feminine, refined Jafar with his lovely eyeliner coming between the straight heroes. And in 94, Scar with his limp wrist, or limp paw, and his dramatic affectations. Oh. Yeah, I've said too much. My point is, from their very first outing, Disney dipped into the well of queer tropes in order to make their villains extra scary. And then they kept dipping back in for decades. But hold on a minute. These stereotypes are generally pretty negative. So why would gay audiences love these characters if they're depicted as dangerous perverts? Well, for one thing, keep in mind that for decades, the only way queer audiences could see someone like themselves on screen was either as a tragic sicko who dies at the end, or a powerful scenery-chewing villain who, well, also dies at the end. But between the two, it's no wonder that a lot of people were drawn to the villains. To some extent, bad representation can feel better than no representation. As Harvey Firestein put it, My view has always been visibility at any cost. But if it's simply a case of, eh, better than nothing, why are so many of these characters remembered fondly? Why are so many of them loved? Well, it turns out that by giving villains tropes that were meant to make them seem queer, and therefore creepy, Disney wound up making their villains more appealing to queer audiences. Let me show you what I mean, and we'll start with how, for all of their flaws, Disney villains can sometimes be pretty relatable, and not just to gays. Let's go back to Maleficent, who starts Sleeping Beauty by crashing a party. I really felt quite distressed at not receiving an invitation. You weren't wanted. Oh dear, what an awkward situation. Honestly, at this point, I think Maleficent's handling herself better than I would if everyone threw a party and invited everyone they knew, except me. And being told to her face that she's not wanted, that is harsh. I think at one time or another, we've probably all felt the sting of being left out of some group. And to be fair, responding to a party snub by placing a death curse on a baby is maybe slightly less relatable. I've only done that once, and that baby had it coming. They had it coming! They had it coming. Depicting a character as a social outcast was another way of coding them as queer, especially during the Hayes era. Homosexuals were frequently shunned in real life and on screen. Here's a movie poster from the time that referred to them as the children of loneliness, which honestly sounds like a b-side by Evanescence. Anyway, Disney often made their villains outcasts, sometimes from society, other times from their families. Mother always did like Richard best. <laughs> Prince John is painfully aware of being the black sheep of the family and living in his brother's shadow. I told you never to mention my brother's name. And side note, John's mother never appears in this film, but if we're going by the history books, she would have been Eleanor of Aquitaine. I don't much like our children. Boy, that old lady really did a number on him. Anyway, John comports himself with slightly less dignity than Maleficent. Long live King Richard! Long live King, King Richard. Richard! Enough! I am king! 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 Ah! But I do get how he feels. Disappointing my parents was an intense concern for me as a kid, especially as I was figuring out that I was gay, but also because I was just a weird child whose favorite activity was constructing hiding places around the house and then whispering Robin Hood fanfic into a tape recorder under the impression that nobody could hear me when, in fact, they almost certainly could. I think a lot of us, queer and otherwise, have felt anxious about our family's approval. Now, I'm not saying that Prince John and his skinny legend boyfriend handled that anxiety well. And remember, it was your idea. I hypnotized him and... Uh, I know and sent him off on that crazy crusade. Aha! <laughs> Aha! And by the way, that is a banana's way to explain the origin of the Crusades. But my point is that John is just one in a long line of Disney villains who are outcasts, in ways that would be familiar to a lot of viewers. Oh no! It's so miserably unfair! Twenty years later, another fussy lion would have the exact same lament. Life's not fair, is it? Like John, Scar knows he's the outcast of the family. Scar's a moody, unathletic loner. Mufasa's an outgoing jock. Honestly, if they weren't brothers, I'd ship them. Anyway, this time we get to see how the villain's family looks down on him. There's one in every family, sir. Two in mine, actually. What am I going to do with him? He'd make a very handsome throw rug. Sazu. Whenever he gets dirty, you could take him out and beat him. <laughs> and three years later, Disney makes good on the threat. Making villains into outcasts is another form of queer coding, but unlike with the creepier tropes, 
a lot of people in the audience could probably recognize themselves in these characters and the ways that they're not wanted. Maybe feel some amount of sympathy for them. Banished and exiled and practically starving. Okay, so Disney villains are usually on the fringes, pushed away from their families, shunned by their communities, and that can feel relatable. But it still doesn't fully explain why gays go gaga for them. For that, we're gonna need to go to camp. Now, if we really wanted to do a deep dive on what camp is, We'd be here for hours, so let me give you the short version by paraphrasing Susan Sontag. Camp is one way of seeing the world, not in terms of beauty, but in terms of artifice, of stylization. In other words, camp is a performance. It's stylized, larger than life. Often it's so ugly it's beautiful, or so serious it becomes silly. As John Waters puts it, The tragically ludicrous? The ludicrously tragic? Oh yeah, like when a clown dies. It's hard to define camp, but you kinda know it when you see it. A villain's flamboyant, over-the-top costumes and mannerisms tell you these characters do not fit in. And the best villains revel in the freedom that comes when you stop trying to conform. They camp it up. So, I'm your little one-eyed winch. I'm also the great tyrant. Hello, Batman. Cheers. But no villain does camp like a Disney villain. While Snow White's tasteful and demure, the Evil Queen gets to vamp around her palace, sweeping her cape like she's voguing with flags at a drag ball. The campier she gets, the more she enjoys herself. A crucial part of camp is playing a role, not being natural, but absurdly exaggerated. The Evil Queen knows the importance of turning a look, and by the time she's disguised as an over-the-top old crone, she's having the time of her life. <laughs> Maleficent's pretty similar. She's the only character in the film who's truly extravagant. Compared to everyone else, she looks like the only contestant on Drag Race who understood the assignment. She even outdoes the evil queen's transformation, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and loving every minute. <laughs> The laughter here is important. They're having fun. They love being free to do their own thing without a care for what the world says is good or bad. And that makes it fun to watch them, especially a villain like Cruella. My only true love, darling, I live for furs. I worship furs. Now this is someone living for style, killing for style, a camp icon. Look at the pleasure it brings her. She steals every scene. So it's no surprise that Cruella's performance is based on Tallulah Bankhead, a queer woman who was a camp icon throughout her entire career. Uh, it certainly is a lovely day, isn't it, ma'am? Oh, shut up. And of course, there's Ursula, whose ostentatious look was inspired by Divine. She becomes ludicrously larger than life when she claims victory. You pitiful, insignificant fool! You might notice that I keep bringing up drag and queer icons. That's because camp has long been connected with queer culture, even before it was really even acknowledged. Classic camp films like All About Eve, Mildred Pierce, The Valley of the Dolls had a huge gay following. There's even a fascinating cross-pollination of queer camp between Disney and John Waters. Snow White's Evil Queen inspired the look for Peggy Gravel in Desperate Living, and then Divine's look in Pink Flamingos inspired Ursula's look in The Little Mermaid. As Susan Sontag wrote, not all homosexuals have camp taste, but homosexuals, by and large, constitute the most articulate audience of camp. So why do the gays love camp so much? That is an enormous question for another video, but I will say this. A cornerstone of camp is exaggeration. Exaggerating something can be a way of making fun of it or questioning how much of it was real to begin with. So, for example, if a character exaggerates masculine or feminine stereotypes, audiences might laugh at how silly those stereotypes suddenly seem. But there's one thing that's even gayer than camp about Disney villains, and that's doing crimes. The best Disney villains are go-getters. They can see that the world is against them, but they don't just accept their situation. They come up with a plan to change it. When Maleficent's slighted by the king and queen, she lets them know she's pissed and that she's not going to take it. Prince John isn't content to let his brother overshadow him. He comes up with a plan to dethrone him. Radigan wants to control all of England via robotic queen. Ursula, Jafar, Scar all want to overthrow rulers who believe treated them unfairly and take their place. So am I suggesting that we love these characters because of all the hypnosis and kidnapping and regicide? That does sound like a fun weekend, but no, there's more to it than that. First of all, who doesn't enjoy a nice little revenge fantasy from time to time? But more to the point, in movies, villains are often the characters who try to change the status quo. Heroes often want to maintain or restore it. Oh, I just can't wait to be king. That feels great if the status quo works for you, but if it doesn't, you might find yourself rooting for the villains to tear it down. 
Villains can't live in the world as it is, so they change it. I don't think it's hard to see why that might resonate with queer people. Just think about all the ways that queer folks have stood up to an unfair world over the last few decades. For example, even as the Hades Code was ending in the 1960s, it was still virtually impossible to make movies with openly queer characters. Teenage John Waters refused to accept that. He got a movie camera from his grandmother, he rounded up his weird friends, started making the queerest, trashiest, most taboo-breaking films that he could. So on one side was John's group, who called themselves the Dreamlanders. On the other was the Maryland Film Censor Board, which viewed the Dreamlanders as villains. Censors accused the movies of being dangerous filth that would corrupt audiences. Oh my gosh, that was a disgraceful, sacrilegious and everything. But here's the thing, you can't buy that kind of publicity. Audiences turned out in droves to see these smutty, forbidden films. And that success allowed John to make more movies, each one bigger than the last. Each time, he put more and more queer characters on screen, pushing open a door that moral guardians had kept locked since the 1930s, helping to transform American cinema into something far more daring and bold and openly queer. Divine, are you a lesbian? Yes, I have done everything. And John's not the only pioneer who decided to change the world. Take a look at the 1968 documentary The Queen, which goes behind the scenes at a New York drag pageant and captures the moment one person changed queer culture forever. Going all the way back to the 1800s, New York drag balls had always heavily favored white contestants. Black contestants almost never won, were even expected to lighten their skin in order to compete. And sure enough, near the end of The Queen, we see the judges once again award the crown to a white performer. But that's when Crystal Abeja, a black contestant, decides that she's had enough. Crystal, where are you going? This is not the time to show temperament. Crystal takes control. She stalks off the stage. She grabs the attention of the documentary crew, and she tells them exactly how unfair she thinks the pageant is. And where's Miss Sabrina? Because I'll sue the bitch. The judges didn't have any taste. It was with you that the judges was with, darling. The documentary gives Crystal what today we'd call a villain edit. They depict her as disruptive, breaking the decorum of the event. It's in bad taste and you're showing your colors and you have I am, I am doing it bad, but I got an, I have a right to show my color, darling. I am beautiful and I know I'm beautiful. But her story doesn't end with this one documentary. After that night, Crystal came up with a plan. She created her own pageants, by and for people of color who had been pushed to the margins for decades. She created new drag balls and the drag houses that still exist today, the ones that we see in Paris is Burning and Pose. Crystal was pushed to her limit by an unfair system. She saw that the world as it was would never make room for people like her, so she decided to change it. And just two years after the events of the Queen, America saw its biggest queer uprising yet. It was a night in late June when the police barged into the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village. Gay bars were illegal back then, and the cops planned to shut the place down and arrest the patrons as they had countless times before. But that night, everyone had had enough. Led by folks like Stormy Delarvery, they fought back against the police. And at the time, this was not well received by the straight world. News coverage painted the rioters as villains and sided with the cops. But those rioters did something that had previously seemed unthinkable. They successfully pushed back against the police, they laid the foundation to end the raids, and they created a movement towards liberation that has kept going step by step for over 50 years. John Waters, Crystal Abasia, the Stonewall Rioters, they all had a choice, either accept the world as it was and get pushed to the margins, or try to change things. They chose to stand up and make a change. In each case, it was a long shot, and they were all considered villains in their time. But in the end, they lived up to a principle that Cleve Jones often says. Only when large numbers of people demand everything immediately do we ever get anything eventually. So no wonder we love these villains. Disney coded them as queer to make them seem like a threat to mainstream audiences. But queer audiences saw something different. Ourselves. And ways to fight for what we want in a world that's not made for us. Maybe what sticks with you is their iconic costumes. Isn't that a new fur coat? Their scenes dealing songs. They weren't kidding when they called me well a witch. Or their cutting shade. How oh, quaint. Even the rabble. Whatever it is, these flamboyant outsiders with dreams of taking down the status quo have stuck with us for nearly a century. And for that whole time, have been having more fun than us. You're beautiful. <laughs> of course, we've only just scratched the surface of Disney villains. And in making this video, I dug up a lots of fun behind the scenes stories that I just didn't have room for in this script. But if you want to hear about the unauthorized Snow White who nearly took down the Oscars in 1989, the banned films from the 30s that exposed the daughters of Lesbia, and how Disney might have based the evil queen on Drew Barrymore's great uncle in drag, I'll be posting all those in bonus videos over on my Patreon. And go subscribe to my newsletter at mattbound.com for sneak peeks at what I'm working on next. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta go get vaccinated. For you are now the proud owner of 
Rabies!